I'm Simon Redfall, former intelligence officer and star of the Lethal Rain series. Welcome to book one in this post-apocalyptic weather control action thriller. Before we get into the story, we'd appreciate it if you could like and subscribe to this channel to help support the author and allow him to continue to post his stories on here for free. With that said, it's time to dive into the mayhem. I'll check back in with you in a bit. Chapter 1 Simon Redfall kept his head down and his eyes low as he took a seat in the general admissions section of the sold-out National Execution Center in Washington, D.C. If it weren't for his long hair and unruly beard, certainly one of the 20,000 blood-starved fans would have recognized him before the start of the most eagerly anticipated event in pay-per-view history. A sprawling stage with a lavish red curtain was the focal point of the venue and built specifically for the government's new execution channel, dubbed EC-1. The arena featured sweeping sight lines to give those in attendance a perfect view of the dying criminal who would soon be unveiled for the world to see. Every detail of the inaugural event had been planned and refined to ensure wide cross-section appeal and massively high broadcast ratings. Nothing was left to chance, not when the most hated mass murderer in modern history was about to draw her last breath with all of humanity watching and cheering. The U.S. government had partnered with Starbright Networks to squeeze every last dollar from what was sure to be a media feeding frenzy. The government's take of the revenue split was reported to be somewhere north of $4 billion, and that didn't include the bonus profits from the new global wagering tax being levied by the world's governments on thousands of betting houses across the planet. The over-under line on the official execution time was initially set at 3 minutes 8.2 seconds by the Wizards in Las Vegas. However, Simon hadn't been following the betting line since it was first published, so he didn't know the current odds of this inaugural event. The National Execution Center, or NEC as it was called on the street, was designed like an upscale Broadway theater, but on an enormous scale. Simon counted at least 32 ultra-high-resolution TV cameras and several dozen members of law enforcement, meaning he'd better keep a low profile if he had any hope of remaining anonymous and making it out of the auditorium alive. General admission seating was located in the balconies and divided into three progressively wider sections, each with a clear view of the ultra-high-resolution jumbo screen mounted above the stage. Below him were two VIP sections of different sizes. The larger, unprotected area on the left was reserved for friends and family of the innocent victims, while the smaller, bulletproof glass cubicle on the right was for the expected handful of supporters of the condemned, in this case, a middle-aged businesswoman. Not your typical mass murderer, but one nonetheless. The lights in the theater began to dim as theatrical, heart-pounding music rose up through the impressive surround sound system, sending those in attendance into a chanting frenzy. A plush, red curtain opened from the middle, then a single spotlight found the master of ceremonies walking to the front of the stage with a wireless microphone in his hand. The jumbo video screen above the platform flashed his name in eye-catching white letters. Clarence Williams III. Red, white, and blue lights flashed in a rotating spiral around the stage, sending a chill of unwanted patriotism into Simon's spine. Mr. Williams waved to the crowd as he walked to the center of the stadium's platform and stood in front of the execution chamber, a 20-foot square metal box built with a single one-way viewing window along the front. Citizens of the world, Williams said, his voice booming through the PA system. The NEC and the G20 countries of the world welcome you to the greatest show on Earth. The crowd cheered in response with raised fists pumping in the air. Let's get started, he said in an emphatic voice, raising his hand and pointing an index finger up to the video screen. We all know why we're here today but I'd like everyone to take a moment to pay their respects to the victims of this most heinous crime. Please direct your attention to the star-bright screen above me and offer a silent prayer 
for each of those who've been lost. The music waned, and the crowd fell silent in an emotional hush when a video began to play on the jumbo screen. A panoramic sweep of the camera showed dozens of bodies, each lying motionless on the street in pools of their own blood. Men, women, and children, all dead. An entire busload of visiting scientists and their families gunned down without mercy. The video stopped 20 seconds later, focusing on a single face, a tiny brunette girl the world had come to know as Dina Davis, a beautiful six-year-old who was gunned down while clutching her pink teddy bear. The corpse next to her was that of her pregnant mother, who'd been ripped in half by the perpetrator's AK-47, exposing more of her belly than should have been allowed for public viewing. Simon looked away, unable to keep his eyes on the infamous footage, feeling a gut-wrenching pain that had become a near-constant companion for the past two years. He'd seen it countless times, as had most everyone in attendance, he figured. It had been the lead story on nearly every news feed he'd watched since the mass shooting happened. There was probably only a handful of people across the entire planet who hadn't memorized every detail of the carnage, all of it captured live by the swarm of news crews on scene that warm summer day in Washington, D.C. The music started again, and so did the crowd, pushing through the emotional fog suffocating the auditorium. M.C. Williams swung an arm up, bringing the house lights up along with it. Starbright Networks is proud to present to you, live this afternoon, the execution of a vile, despicable criminal. Right here, in the execution chamber behind me, is the woman who slaughtered 64 innocent men, women, and children, and did so in cold blood. The crowd roared, chanting for action. Die, bitch, die. Williams continued, raising his voice. Those of you in preferred seating, please bring your attention to the viewing window behind me. Citizens in the balconies, please keep your eyes locked on the star-bright display above. And to our billions of viewers watching from around the world, don't move from your television. This is the moment you've all been waiting for. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you public enemy number one, the most hated terrorist in modern history. Then the MC said the name of the criminal. Tessa Jane, wife of Simon Redfall. The knot in Simon's stomach doubled in size when he heard his beloved's name being broadcast to billions of live viewers, bringing home the grotesque reality of the moment. The lights inside the chamber beamed on, showing the weary face of a slender blonde woman strapped to a vertical stainless steel table. The crowd cheered and stomped their feet in unison, keeping with the beat of the theatrical music, while the video feed zoomed in on her tearful eyes. Each time the stadium shook with foot-pounding thunder, it felt like a nail being driven farther and farther into Simon's heart, condemning him to wander the halls of anguish alone. Until now, everything Simon had been through since the killings happened felt like a waking dream, a horrific quagmire from which there was no escape. He'd been forced to watch his life unravel, one thread at a time, feeling as though he was watching a sick, demented play through someone else's eyes. Someone who was never married to the love of his life. A suburban, well-educated wife who went off the rails and killed a busload of dignitaries and their families. He hadn't planned to be here today to witness Tessa's execution. In fact, only four days prior, he was traveling on foot, making his way to the next town in Oregon, where he'd find yet another vacant cardboard box in an alley to sleep in before continuing his volunteer work at the nearest shelter. But out of nowhere, an unseen force rose up and stopped his wandering quest of penitence, turning him around and bringing him here to Washington. He wasn't sure what it was, but it was something powerful inside that he couldn't control. At first... He thought this unexpected voyage to D.C. was brought on by mounting remorse for what his wife had done. However, after careful reflection during the long bus ride to the East Coast, he decided it had to be more. He'd certainly accumulated his share of regret over the years and knew how to handle guilt, 
especially back when his days were consumed with running his former security conglomerate, Ghostworks, LLC. The NEC's music continued, picking up its beat. So did the crowd, working themselves into an even bigger fury as the MC pranced around, leading the bloodthirsty mob like an angry cheerleader. Simon wasn't sure how he'd feel after his wife of two decades was brutally killed on stage, but he felt compelled to be here. His own personal nightmare was about to end after a grueling 24 months in the making. All the while, his insides had been locked in a permanent struggle between love and hate, tearing him apart in the process. His love affair with Tessa began blissfully in high school and hadn't taken a single moment off in the years that followed. But that all changed in a heartbeat, one bloody afternoon in the nation's capital. Simon swung his eyes to the attendees below him in the two reserved VIP sections, but his attention wasn't on his wife's side of the family. It was on the families of the victims. His wife was guilty. He knew it, and the world knew it. There was no denying what happened and who was responsible. Her monstrous crime had been caught live and from multiple angles by the cameras covering the scientific conference and its arriving VIPs. The same set of videos had also gone viral across the internet, which was now privately owned and operated by Starbright Networks, a wholly owned subsidiary of Indigo Technologies. The spread of her disgrace had unified the entire planet, giving the opportunistic media plenty of ammunition to crucify his wife, and him right along with her. The pressure across Simon's chest tightened even more as the lights in the execution chamber began to flicker, grabbing everyone's attention like last call at a neighborhood bar. The image on the video screen changed to show a wide-angle shot of the condemned, his wife, the slayer of women and children. Simon couldn't tear his eyes away. Tessa was crying hysterically, knowing a painful ending was near. Her arms, legs, and torso were pinned to the table, but her head was not, and Simon knew why. The USA Today newspaper had run an extensive series of articles quoting various Starbright ratings analysts and technicians who outlined the scientific process behind the new execution system. The network had found, through the testing of various focus groups, that pay-per-view sales and the betting pools would be exponentially higher if the inmate could move her head and make eye contact with the cameras situated around the chamber. And they'd be even larger if the audience could hear the criminal beg, plead, and scream for mercy. As a result, Starbright's motivated construction crews had spent the past few weeks installing far more cameras and microphones than originally planned, hoping to reap the windfall as ratings skyrocketed and wagers mounted. Congress and the White House had sanctioned this new revenue stream, hoping that public executions would become the new national pastime and generate the pile of money needed to keep the country's multi-trillion dollar budget shortfall in check. Simon knew a desperate U.S. government would resort to almost anything to keep the doors open, but what surprised him was how quickly the rest of the world jumped on board. The approval of live PPV executions raced through the various governing bodies across the planet without a hint of opposition. Of course, it helped that the recent passage of legalized prostitution and across-the-board gambling had generated trillions of new tax dollars worldwide. Another development Redfall never saw coming. Those newfound bounties were needed after the spend-happy politicians burned through the generous cash reserves created by global marijuana sales the year before. In hindsight, betting on PPV executions was the next logical progression of the cash-starved governing bodies, each looking for every penny they could find. Just then, a dated photograph of his wife appeared on the stadium screen, bringing an outburst of boos from the crowd. It showed Tessa standing on the lawn of the White House, wearing an elegant evening dress and perfect makeup. The snapshot caught her smiling and in mid-applause as the president hung a lifetime service medal around Simon's neck. He remembered the glorious day well. It was back when his professional life and his marriage were on cruise control, enjoying the pinnacle of success. 
It was also the one and only time the commander-in-chief recognized his years of dedication and support to the intelligence community. However, the memory faded into a painful sting when a virtual flame appeared on the jumbo display and set the photograph ablaze for all in attendance to see. His eyes darted left and right, checking to see if anyone might have noticed him in attendance. It didn't appear so. He figured everyone was too enthralled with the theatrics being put on by the NEC for anyone to notice that the second most hated person on the planet was sitting nearby. Of course, it helped that Simon looked nothing like the clean-cut, successful businessman he'd been before Tessa had gone insane. He now had long hair and an unkempt, scraggly beard and wanted to keep it that way until after the execution. He was glad to be flying under the radar feeling the anger and bloodlust of the people around him. If they knew who he was, they'd tear him apart like a pack of hungry wolves. His eyes turned to the video screen, seeing Tessa fighting like a wild animal. Her hair was flailing about her shoulders and neck, even though it had been trimmed to network specifications, long enough to make her appealing, but not so long as to obscure her eyes. Eyes were the key the analysts had determined and reported in the national paper. Then, Tessa's eyes found a camera in the corner of the chamber, and she stopped moving. Her body relaxed, and an eerie calm spread across her face. She licked her lips, cleared her throat, and spoke directly into the camera. Simon? Simon, are you there? It wasn't me, honey. I didn't do it. You have to believe me. Why don't you believe me? I could never do something like this. Never in a million years. Simon clenched his jaw, holding back the desperation pounding at his chest. His heart wanted him to sprint through the angry horde and set her free, but his logic couldn't reconcile the evil she'd unleashed upon the world. The woman in the chamber isn't my Tessa, he told himself. Not anymore. The Tessa he knew and loved, the woman he'd been married to for twenty-plus years, the person he trusted above all others was dead and gone, lost somewhere between the folds of heartache and disgrace. A wickedly dark force had taken control of her soul, forcing him to stand firm in the balcony and let the world's revenge take center stage. Are you ready for the sentencing to be carried out? The MC asked the crowd. The crowd roared and continued to stomp their feet, each time with a sharp clap of their hands. Someone near Simon yelled, Die! 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 Now, before we get started, I have a very special surprise for all of you in attendance and for all of you watching at home today. Our amazing chemists have made some ingenious changes to the process that we think you'll like. Instead of a calm, quick, mostly painless death, your government and the governments of the world have given their blessing for a more entertaining process. Our new lethal injection system has been redesigned to provide a longer, more painful kill time, just as it should be. No mass murderer of innocents should ever get off easy with a quick, painless death. Am I right? Cheers and applause rose up, then a unified chant roared around Simon. Kill her now! Kill her now! Kill her now! Well then, I won't keep you waiting, the MC said, touching a hand to his ear. Citizens of the world, I have word from our technicians in the control room that all systems are ready. Let the countdown begin. The number 10 appeared over Tessa's image on the giant screen, then changed to 9. The crowd joined in reminding Simon of the chant on New Year's Eve in Times Square when the New Year's ball is dropped. The volume grew as the countdown continued. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The numbers disappeared from the display and were replaced by giant letters that flashed, Commence Execution. The crowd went wild at a sudden close-up of Tessa's face, just as the injection was pushed into her veins by the automated delivery system. A digital timer appeared in the upper right corner of the video screen, showing the seconds tick by now that the process had begun. It was labeled as the official execution time. 
The USA Today described the injection process as a mix of lethal compounds administered in small, arbitrary increments to lengthen the process and randomize the time of death, all of it geared specifically to maximize both her suffering and the network's ratings. Simon winced when Tessa's head began to thrash back and forth, and her blue eyes went wild with fright. Her full, pink lips contorted in a feral display of anguish as spittle flew from her lips. She moaned and cried out under a torrent of sweat and tears streaming down her face. Die, murderer, die! The crowd yelled as a mixed chorus of cheers, whistles, and boos echoed off the walls of the arena. The public had been waiting for this event with bated breath, and the execution had been marketed to perfection. Starbright Networks knew what it was doing. Tessa opened her mouth to speak again, but her body twitched, and a gurgling noise rose from her throat. The process was now in full swing, ravaging her body from the inside out. The cheers and jeers from the live audience grew in volume and intensity at the sight of her grimacing and drooling. The spectators around him were all on their feet, waving their arms in the air and shaking their fists. Simon tore his eyes from the video screen and scanned the crowd below. Behind the families of the victims sat invited government and network VIPs, each with popcorn and beer in their laps, cheering with the rest of the crowd. Everyone in the first level of the stadium seats had a perfect view of the one-way window into the execution chamber. Emotions were at a fever pitch in all directions, and he assumed the same was occurring all around the world. He imagined scores of drunken spectators in bars, homes, and off-site betting houses throwing their money down in officially sanctioned locations. The wagers were all in virtual currency, of course, except in the seedy black market betting parlors where old-school paper currency passed between the rough, calloused hands of hardened criminals, drug addicts, and down on their luck outcasts. his marriage. Two minutes? Three minutes? Five minutes? The official timer in the upper corner of the screen kept ticking, tracking every second that scrolled by like some twisted scoreboard of the damned. When Tessa's life eventually came to an end, fortunes would arrive for those with the precise wager that matched the official execution time, down to a tenth of a second. The light in the execution chamber faded, and a red glow surrounded the gleaming steel table. A single soft white spotlight illuminated Tessa's face. Her skin began to grow pink as small purple sores appeared on her cheeks and neck. The image on the screen panned back to reveal her entire body. She was clad in a tight white athletic bra and matching tight white shorts, both chosen to maximize the bloodbath that was about to begin. Two more chamber lights ignited and then panned up to show her body more clearly. The blanket of purple sores began to erupt, first on her arms, then her legs and torso. Simon gulped with hands shaking, hating himself for turning his back on her. But she'd left him no choice. All that was left to do now was stand with the others and watch the criminal die. Then his torment would finally be over. Tessa rolled her head to the side and found her voice again, though it was threaded and uneven. Simon, she pleaded through the obvious pain. Simon, help me. I love you, darling, with all my heart. His heart stung but his feet never moved while the crowd screamed despicable insults at her. More sores appeared and spread across her face and chest, getting larger as her skin changed color from pink to dark red. Then her body began to shake uncontrollably. Her eyes went bloodshot, and her arms and legs began to swell like inflating balloons. The swelling filled her torso, then her face and head. The skin of her face stretched tight, distorting her features into a sickening, clown-like grimace. The theater shook as the audience in the balconies stomped their feet and chanted in unison, Die! 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 
The boils across her body had grown and merged together, making her skin purple from head to toe. A moment later, they began to split and crack, first on her chest as blood seeped through the clean white top she wore. Then her forehead began to break apart, turning her face into something less than human, her body expanding around the straps holding her in place. Then it happened. She exploded from the inside out, sending a shower of blood and gore outward, covering the inside of the one-way glass and all of the cameras in the execution chamber with a vicious pink and red film. Official execution time. Four minutes, 32.04 seconds, the MC announced. At the same moment, 4.32.04 flashed in bright red letters across the video screen. Streaks of blood and bits of flesh dripped down the chamber window, giving the families of the victims and the rest of the witnesses around the world what they needed most. Closure. Simon never looked away, wanting the ghastly image to burn into his soul as a reminder. A reminder of what can happen when your focus wanders and you lose situational awareness. Yes, even in a loving marriage, diligence is needed on multiple levels. Not just with focusing your love and dedication, but watching for changes in behavior and motivation. Simon stared at Tessa's family huddled together in the protected chamber down in front as he made his way past the other people in his row. The murderer's sister, mother, father, and cousins each had their heads down, buried inside an emotional family hug. His former in-laws were obviously grief-stricken and dumbfounded, unable to process the horrifying spectacle they'd just witnessed. He took a moment to send a stream of compassionate thoughts to them from his elevated position in the balcony. What had happened wasn't their fault. It was his. He should have noticed the changes in his wife. He should have stopped her from killing all those innocents. After all... He was the world's more famous intelligence expert, and yet he never realized that a swell of evil had taken root in the marital bed next to him. The path out of the theater was slow going as he worked through the cheering and applauding band of spectators milling about and congratulating each other. Simon was careful to avoid making eye contact with anyone, just needing to find the exit and let his nightmare end. The rest of his plan was simple slip away into the nothingness that was his future. Chapter 2 Tally Wiki sat with her mouth agape as the execution of Tessa Jane concluded, her eyes fixated on the flat-screen computer monitor in front of her. A faint reflection of her own short hair stared back at her, sticking up in a random pattern of red spikes swirling about her head. She was on the other side of 22 years old, but had been told by one of her reserved Amish neighbors that her face had the serious, worldly look of a person ten years her senior. She squinted her piercing blue eyes at the image on the screen and frowned as a man stood up in the crowd. Is that him? She asked G, short for genius, which was his nickname, the 17-year-old computer whiz sitting next to her in the back of a white cargo van parked in an alley four blocks from the NEC. Soft green light from a bank of instrument panels gave G's pale skin a sickly hue. His face was covered in large dark freckles, and his hair was red, like Tally's, but it clung close to his head in tight curls. Yep, that's him, G replied, having hacked into the internal video feeds of the NEC. You sure? He doesn't look anything like his picture. Granted, it was from ten years ago, but still... Tally said, staring at the left edge of the computer screen where Simon's corporate headshot was frozen in comparison. My software doesn't miss, G assured her. I spent months perfecting the aging algorithms so I know they're dead nuts accurate. Plus, I built my own fractal sampling code using color pair sequencing and linear regression analysis so my imager could identify him regardless of the expected amount of facial hair. And stress lines? Exactly. Tally studied the newly captured still image of Simon Redfall, a man well into his middle years, with a shaggy beard and long matted hair, both streaked with gray. He looked nothing like the man she'd expected to see. 
She swiped her hand in front of the screen, making the image change to a healthy and happy man with short brown hair, bright green eyes, a sun-tanned face, and a vibrant, welcoming smile. Below the corporate mugshot were the words, Simon Redfall, founder and CEO, Ghostworks, LLC. She toggled back and forth between the two images several times and grunted in disbelief. She wouldn't have been able to pick the man out of a crowd based on the ancient photo. Not a chance. So she had no choice but to take G's word on it. If his new facial recognition software said the bearded man was Simon Redfall, then that's who he was. End of story. She had no reason to doubt the kid, who was never wrong and never short on confidence. None of the people at her compound in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, understood why she'd picked G as her only companion on this mission to the city, but she didn't care. He was the most loyal person she'd ever met. That's why she'd chosen him. Well, that, and the fact he was a master tech wizard. Exactly what this operation needed. Technology, not more bodies. He looks terrible, she said, wondering what he'd been doing since the massacre. Well, you probably would, too. He's been off the grid for two years, sold his company, and disappeared after what happened. It looks like he's been living in the woods, under a rock. Plus, he just watched his wife die. What do you expect? I don't know. Not that. She gestured toward the ragged man on the screen. Okay, he's up and moving toward the exit. If those crazies would just get out of his way. Come on, people, let him by, G said, yelling at the screen. He swung his eyes to Tally. Orders, boss? Where I go? Time to make contact. Is the link to DC surveillance stable? G danced his fingers in front of the computer's virtual interface and nodded. Yep, stable. I got the whole area covered. Like God, I can see everything. What about us? We're hidden in one of the only three blind spots in the entire district. They'd have a better chance of spotting a ghost in a closet than us. Excellent. Once you're ten feet past the front bumper, I'll have you in my sights, all the way to the NEC. You're good to go. Keep a lock on me. There are a lot of hungry, desperate people out there, Tally said, tucking a small black piece of plastic into her right ear. Won't be a problem. My techno voodoo is unstoppable. Tally pulled a sleek black phone out of her pocket, then put two fingers together and made a circle motion in front of it to power it on. The main screen appeared, which then took her to the only app installed on the device. The screen filled with signal strength indicators, sending a smile to her lips. Looks like comms are up. Nice job, G. Efficient as usual. G took out an identical piece of plastic and slid it into his right ear. I aim to please, he said, using crisp words. We'll test as soon as you're en route for an intercept. Gotcha, she confirmed, hesitating to give G a serious look. You ready for this, G? We'll only get one shot, so let's follow the plan by the numbers. I'm ready, Wix. Don't forget, I helped you write the protocols. She smiled, but didn't respond. G focused his gaze, looking at the computer screen, and then back at her. You sure he's the one? She nodded. If anyone can help us, it's Simon Redfall. Simon hunched his shoulders and kept his head down as he made his way out of the grand entrance of the National Execution Center. The NEC was designed to make its audience feel important, like they were attending the opening of a star-studded musical. The marquee was trimmed in red with ornate gold flourishes. On his way in, Simon had stopped and stared at the words written in bright, bold letters. Live today, 3 p.m., the execution of Tessa Jane, wife of Simon Redfall, the butcher of Bay Street. Police stopped traffic in front of the theater to keep the exiting crowds from clogging up the sidewalk. The execution audience spilled across the street, filled with the adrenaline rush that came from watching a human being die in a spectacularly painful fashion. Simon slipped into the flow and let himself be pulled along with the herd, hoping to blend in and maintain a low profile. It worked, taking him swiftly across the street and onto the sidewalk in front of a bicycle store. To his right, a gaggle of reporters waited like vultures, scanning the exiting crowd for interviews and comments, probably looking for families of the victims. 
anything to boost ratings, he figured. Just beyond the indulging news crews, a mob of well-dressed protesters had gathered and were chanting rhythmically behind a daunting line of policemen in full riot gear. Executions are murder. Stop the killing. Repeal the law. He ignored the band of righteous and continued along for another block, drifting downstream like a wayward guppy. When he made it to the next intersection, a stiff breeze smacked him across the cheek. It felt amazing, tickling the hairs on his face and neck. He changed course and moved to the courthouse steps, sending the rush of humanity on without him. The sky above him was a crystal clear blue. Its stunning simplicity reminded him of how beautiful life truly is, especially when you've been buried alive under a mountain of shame. Sure, one side of his heart was still awash in grief, but the other side felt invigorated and full of life for the first time in two years. He craned his neck to enjoy the newfound freedom, feeling the wind gush across his face. It caressed the mop of hair covering his head and chin, ridding his brow of the sweat. He took a deep breath and stood on his toes at full height, six feet four inches, with his arms out in relief. Deep down, he knew his love for Tessa would always be strong, but it was time to move on. He'd spent enough time trying to make amends for her public rampage. Eventually, you have to let the past go, especially when you've been consumed with finding meaning in something unfathomable. First up on the to-do list, find a barber and take care of two years of neglect, then rent a room somewhere and soak in the tub. Some fresh clothes and a change of socks would be nice, too. The flurry of humanity continued in front of him, speeding past in waves. He was about to slip into the crowd and continue his journey, but stopped when he noticed a small figure standing in a doorway, pointing at him. The watcher was across the street and wearing a hooded sweatshirt. The slender person took a few steps toward him and stopped before pulling the hood back to reveal a face. It was a woman. Wait, check that. A young girl. She couldn't have been more than 20 years old. She had spiked red hair, and even from a distance, he could see her bright blue eyes. She gave Simon a single head nod, acting as if she knew him. He didn't recognize her. Who was she? Before he could blink, a distant voice called out from the right, in the same direction as the news media. Redfall? Simon swung his head and found a tall woman in her thirties with platinum blonde hair and just a dash of makeup. She was pointing at him with a microphone in hand. He recognized the reporter, who was standing next to a cameraman on the sidewalk, only twenty yards away. Two other news crews were following behind her, all of them on an intercept course to his position. Simon turned away, praying she hadn't just put the pieces together. Her name was Mary McGrady, and she'd interviewed him 15 years earlier when his company first went public. He didn't know why, but his eyes went in search for the young redhead across the street. The girl wasn't there, possibly scared off by the growing presence of news personnel, he decided. Redfall? Simon Redfall? The reporter screamed from behind. Simon didn't want to look back, but he did. Her eyes flew wide. Hey, it's him, the reporter screamed. Simon Redfall, I remember those eyes. Get that camera over there. Simon didn't hesitate. His feet took off in a flash, running away from the reporters and slipping into the mass of people. The crowd had thinned a bit, but was still dense. He pushed several people out of the way, allowing his legs to pick up speed and put some distance between himself and the media. He knew it wouldn't be long before everyone in the vicinity knew who he was. Chapter 3 Zeke Olson dodged the dancing hipsters and annoying beggars of Seattle's Pike Street Market and found the address relayed to him by his boss. It was tucked down an alleyway between a jet board shop and a high-end baby boutique. The entrance door was in a darkened alcove and was made of reinforced steel and painted a bland industrial gray. A one-inch square symbol 
had been stenciled to the upper right corner of the doorframe, tagging the secret location. The familiar dark blue pyramid with three parallel white lines running through it at a 45-degree angle told him he was in the right place. It was the secret mark of his eccentric boss, and always used to identify covert locations and safe houses for those inside Indigo's circle of trust. The moment Zeke's feet stepped into the shadow of the door, a series of tiny red LED lights appeared on the wall above the entrance and on either side of him. He stopped short and never touched the door handle, per the instructions delivered via text message by his boss, Vito Indigo, founder and CEO of the world's largest technology corporation, Indigo Technologies. The message was simple and clear. Step into the doorway at the appointed time and wait. Zeke knew better than to ask for clarification. He'd risen to second in command by following Indigo's directions to the letter, whether he agreed with them or not. All of his success was due to his amazing boss, a man who took a shot and hired him without much experience after a single interview. Zeke was proud and content to be a company man, pure and simple. He was 55 years old, meek-looking and forgettable. The only thing even vaguely remarkable about him was the permanent twitch in his right cheek. Every minute or so, his nervous disorder would flare up, drawing the corner of his mouth up as if he was trying not to smile. He first suffered the condition 12 years prior after recovering from a nasty bout with Bell's palsy. The illness started immediately after a lengthy visit to Nepal, where he'd been tasked to handle a series of complex purchases along the Fiwa Lake waterfront. It was easy to remember that trip. Not so much for the billion-dollar investment, but rather for the odd weather event on the last day. For 16 minutes... The heavens opened and dumped rain across the massive resort, but not just any rain, thick, sticky, red-colored rain. The locals feared some type of extraterrestrial event had taken place, but after thorough investigation, the scientific community came together and declared the strange meteorological event a direct result of an accumulation of European microalgae in the atmosphere. He didn't understand the biological processes at work, but the rest of the world accepted the explanation, and so did he. Zeke waited patiently as lasers scanned his entire body, focusing on his lips, eyes, and hands. He'd been through hundreds of similar scans in various secure facilities around the world over the past 20-plus years. However, this was the first time he'd visited this Seattle location, even though Indigo Technologies was once the proud owner of a sprawling 20-acre office complex just north of the city ten years before. It took almost four years, but Zeke was finally able to dump the investment for his boss after some crafty, last-second negotiations with a local real estate mogul. Seattle is old news, his boss had told him. D.C. is the center of the action. Just get it done. Zeke shrugged and followed his boss's directives, which were to relocate their corporate headquarters to a suburb of Washington. The cryptic instructions and sudden decision to sell didn't surprise him, though. Indigo did what he wanted and never bothered to explain his decisions to anyone, not even to his newly minted senior vice president and second-in-command. The lasers stopped their dance and the red lights faded. The door in front of him shook for a moment, then he heard a click. The door popped open, and the text message notification on his phone chimed. He pulled the phone from his pocket and brought up the message. Enter, was all it said. Zeke walked into a foyer, where lights flashed on, and the door closed behind him automatically. He looked around. The only way in or out was the entrance he just passed through. However, the exit quickly disappeared when a pair of shiny, silver-colored panels slid across and came together in the middle, covering the doorway with a hiss. The foyer shook. Then Zeke felt a familiar sensation rise up through his legs. At that moment, it all came together. He was in an elevator, heading down. Thirty seconds later, the lift came to a stop and the metal panels slid open, revealing a chamber 
decorated with a thick, indigo-colored carpet and eight equal-sized wall sections that formed an octagon. Each segment had an antique painting hanging in the center, representative of a different period of classical art. There were only two pieces of traditional furniture in the room, an antique mahogany desk with a flat-screen computer monitor and an old-fashioned rotary telephone sitting on top, and a high-back office chair sitting on a trio of metal casters. An autonomous robot moved forward on its twin treads and latched onto the swivel chair with one of its grappler arms, pulling it out at an angle. The gray metal device looked like a five-foot-tall praying mantis with a swooping, drawn-back head that swiveled and a pair of bulging lateral sensors for eyes. Its pair of oddly long, retractable arms gave him the creeps, looking like they were waiting to pounce on him as soon as his head was turned. Zeke recognized the second-generation device, having witnessed its worldwide launch the previous year at Indigo Tech's Spring Technology Conference and Expo in downtown Atlanta. The sales for the personal service robot had been brisk ever since, forever changing the way households were managed and run all over the world. The official name for the product was Butler Bot Mark II, but Zeke thought the name lacked any sort of creativity or marketing sizzle. He'd never mentioned his concerns to Indigo, the same person with whom he was meeting today, and certainly not after his boss dumped a billion dollars into the product's marketing campaign to ensure its rollout was a smashing success. Zeke stepped into the chamber and sat down in the waiting chair, keeping his head turned and eyes fixed on the butler bot. The unit backed away with just an electric hum of its servos and motors. The monitor flickered on, to reveal an image of Vito Indigo. The trillionaire recluse looked to be in his sixties and wore a wide straw hat and sleek, dark sunglasses, his trademark look. His silver-speckled brown hair fell in waves to his shoulders and disappeared off screen. Zeke often wondered how far down the locks traveled, having never met his boss in person. Their meetings were always conducted over video chat and held in secluded locations, like today. Indigo smiled, flashing a set of perfectly white teeth that contrasted with his deeply tanned face and thick goatee. The orange hue across his skin made him look like a laid-back Caribbean native. Maybe the term Caribbean hillbilly would have been more accurate to the uninitiated. Just then, Zeke's mind flashed an image of George Hamilton's DNA being genetically spliced with a pot-smoking surfer dude wearing Jethro Bodine's clothes. Not what most people, including him, would expect the richest man in the world to look like. It had been decades since his job interview with the Enigma, and he still couldn't reconcile the oddities. But who was he to question anything about his mega-successful boss? Good afternoon, Zeke. Indigo said in a soft, controlled voice. Please, have a seat. Hello, sir, Zeke answered, tucking his feet and sitting a little more upright in the chair. You might be wondering why I've brought you here. Zeke's eyes darted about the room, then back to the screen. The thought did cross my mind. Something cataclysmic is about to happen, and I want to keep you out of harm's way. You're very important to me, and have been a loyal confidant even before your recent promotion. Thank you, sir, he said, as his heart began to race, worrying about Indigo's choice of words. Cataclysmic? Watch the monitor and observe. Zeke's eyes focused on the screen in front of him. A moment later, Indigo's face vanished and was replaced with several high-altitude satellite feeds of the Earth. Inside each video window was a growing, red-colored cloud formation. Chapter 4 Redfall? Where? Someone shouted from behind Simon as he continued his sprint down the street. He shot a glance over his shoulder, checking to see if he was putting more distance between the gang of reporters chasing him. He was, thanks in part to the mass of citizens he'd zipped through earlier. Simon turned to keep running, but slammed face first into an overweight, red-faced street vendor selling digital photo frames. He bounced off the big man as the souvenir devices flew everywhere, sending Simon sprawling to the concrete on his back. 
Most of the frames smashed into pieces on the cement, but one of them landed on his chest, giving him a close-up view of its rotating set of images. His wife's tearful face with purple splotches across her skin. The snapshots must have been taken only moments before the lethal cocktail took her life. Simon was furious. Somehow, this vendor had his hands on the photos already and was selling them for profit. Simon shook his head and started to get to his feet, but the vendor kicked him in the gut, knocking the wind out of him. What the fuck, pal? You gonna pay for the shit you broke? The vendor snarled. Simon rolled to his hands and knees, gasping for air. He could see three news crews closing on his position, but they weren't alone. A small knot of execution goers had joined the chase with flared eyes and red cheeks. There! The guy with long hair and beard in the old army jacket, she said. The one who just fell down. He's the husband, a young athletic looking man next to her yelled. They killed my sister, a small woman cried. And my wife, a burly middle-aged man standing next to her added. Get him, the young man said, grabbing the burly man by the arm. Simon figured the posse had grown thanks to the reporters giving chase. People around them must have slowly realized what was happening and joined the hunt. He couldn't blame them. It was human nature after the bloodlust initiated by the live execution. It was still bubbling close to the surface, fueled by alcohol and bolstered by collective anger. He knew the small crowd wasn't satisfied with Tessa's death and would soon grow into a mob, an angry mob seeking revenge. The group started across the street, led by the two angry men. Simon felt a grab on his right arm. Well, buddy, what's it gonna be? The street vendor asked, using his hands to contain Simon. Get your hands off, Simon snapped, shoving the man away. The vendor came at Simon, latching onto the front of his jacket. You owe me money, asshole! Simon pivoted on the ball of his right foot, sweeping his left foot back 90 degrees to snap his torso away from the man's hands. The man fell forward, off balance, just as the athletic young man, whose family Tessa had killed, made it to them. The vendor and the young man ran into each other, then staggered backwards, stunned. A pair of strong hands grabbed Simon's shoulders from behind. He could smell beer and body odor and figured it had to be the burly, middle-aged man. We got you, Redfall. You're gonna pay for what your wife did, a deep voice said, sending a waft of bad breath his way. Simon didn't want to fight these people, so he chose to use evasive tactics. His training kicked in, bringing his arms sharply up to loosen the assailant's tentative hold on his back. Simon bent his knees and let his body fall abruptly, slipping out of the coat that was still pinned in his attacker's hands. Before the three men accosting him knew what was happening, he thrust his legs, diving through a gap in the men. He tucked into a roll and came up on his feet at a full sprint. It had been a while since he'd put his evasion skills to use. It felt good as he bobbed and weaved through the crowd, ignoring the shouts behind him. Are you seeing this? G shrilled across the communication link, his voice brimming with excitement. Tally's earbud cracked under the excessive volume, making her pull a device from her ear. She waited a few seconds until G was done talking before she put it back in. Yeah, I saw it, G. I told you Simon had skills, but I need you to calm down. Otherwise, you're going to break my eardrum. Sorry, he replied, using a softer voice. Is that better? Much she said with inflection, hoping to drive her point home. Where did he go? I lost him in the crowd. Hang on, checking the feeds. Tally tapped her foot on the sidewalk, waiting for a location and direction. She'd planned to approach Redfall and get him somewhere quiet, then make her pitch. She knew something big was happening in the world, but she needed help from someone with the tactics and training to stop it. Simon was at the top of her short list, and there simply wasn't time to find anyone else. Status? she asked. One sec. Okay, there he is. Got him. He's running east. If I was him, I'd turn down. Yep, he did. Now he's in an alley heading south. Location? Two blocks south, approaching 18th. Got it, Tally said, picturing the map of the area in her head. She knew exactly which alley G was talking about. 
It ran lengthwise along the west side of the NEC, intersecting a small cross street that circled around to the other side of the execution center. If she remembered correctly, there was a parking lot just behind her that mirrored the alley Redfall had taken. She turned quickly, found the entrance, and sprinted across it. There's an intersecting alley ahead of you on the right, G said in her ear. If you hurry, already on it, she snapped, cutting him off with huffing breath. Wix, you need to hurry. They're gaining on him. I am, she grunted, tearing down the alleyway. She ran down the passage, planning to cut through the memorial park two streets over and separate Redfall from the mob. There were plenty of hiding places in the park, but she'd have to find a way to slow the mob down. With his skills, she'd guess he'd need only 30 seconds of separation to slip away into the green. Her thighs were burning as she pushed her legs beyond their limits, praying her adrenaline would hold out. Something was nagging at the back of her mind, though. Something at the edge of her memory, stuck there from when she'd gone over the map in the back of the van. It was only a glimmer of a thought, just out of reach. Shit, G said, just as she remembered what it was. Fence, she added. Yeah, and a security team. Not good. Backup plan? She stopped running. You ready to drive, G? Ready as I'll ever be. She changed course, heading to the right. Fire that baby up and meet me at the corner of 15th and Pennsylvania Avenue in three minutes. Don't be late. We have to get him out of there before that mob tears him to pieces. Chapter 5 Simon ran down the alley alongside the NEC. His heart was pumping past Redline and his legs were heating up. Cramps would take over soon if he couldn't find a way to give his pursuers the slip. He glanced over his shoulder and saw at least two dozen people chasing him now, led by the young athletic man who'd run into the street vendor a few minutes earlier. They were closing ground. Where were they all coming from? They couldn't all be members of the victim's families, could they? He regretted letting his physical condition deteriorate the past 24 months, which seemed fitting given his rundown appearance and broken heart. Volunteering at local homeless shelters wasn't exactly a good source of cardio, and neither was swinging a hammer for the good folks at Habitat for Humanity. He'd made a few friends along the way, including a peculiar teenager named Emily and her kleptomaniac of a friend, Junie. But they were in the desert southwest, too far away to help. His mind drifted as he continued the agonizing sprint, figuring he would soon be joining his wife Tessa in the afterlife. Her face filled his mind, and her words rang in his head. It wasn't me, Simon. I didn't do it. You have to believe me. Why don't you believe me? I could never do something like this. Never in a million years. She was guilty, he told himself. He'd seen the video. Everyone had. Still, he couldn't shake the last set of broken syllables she'd said to the camera. Simon, help me. I love you, darling, with all my heart. The words felt like acid rain dripping on the petals of his heart, burning a hole deep inside. Just then, he heard footsteps behind him, snapping him out of the waking memory. You can't hide, Redfall. Time to pay, asshole. We're gonna send you to hell with your bitch wife. He came to a cross street, slowing to a jog. He could see it led to a massive iron gate patrolled by armed guards, the back entrance to the NEC. Two hundred yards away, in the opposite direction, was a busy thoroughfare. Red, yellow, blue, and green Google cabs rushed by, interspersed by the occasional black police cruiser and long, white DC metro buses. A hundred yards in front of him, the alley ended at a moderate-sized boulevard with a wide, grassy central median that looked like it emptied into a park. Bushes and trees, he thought, before looking back. The gang on his trail was fifty yards away and closing. They'd be on him in seconds if he didn't pick up the pace, which he did. His lungs were burning and his side was starting to ache, but he convinced his body to keep going. He focused all his thoughts on his legs, pushing them to their tripping point. Before his lungs could suck in another rush of air, a huge shadow rolled in over the area, casting a reddish glow over everything. Simon craned his neck at the sky and saw massive blood-red clouds circling the city, rolling over themselves like a time-lapse video of a swirling storm. 
The sky had been perfectly clear only moments before, and now this? His feet stopped on their own, allowing his eyes to take in the phenomenon more easily. He'd never seen anything like it before. The redness covered the sky in every direction. How could they have built up so fast? What's the matter, Redfall? You looking for God? One of the male pursuers said into his ear. The words brought him out of the trance, only to find he was surrounded. The hesitation had cost him. The young, athletic man stepped forward with a clenched jaw and fire in his eyes. What do you want from me? Simon asked, already knowing the answer. Retribution, he said, punching Simon in the jaw. Simon staggered and his vision turned red, but he didn't fall. I'm sorry for what she did, but this isn't going to change anything he said through the pain, spitting a patch of blood on the ground. Your wife deserved to die, so do you, the burly man yelled, coming at him with a short piece of two-by-four in his hands. I want you to feel my pain, Redfall. Simon put his arm up to shield his head from the worst of the blow, but the force still knocked him sideways. He staggered again, shocked at the man's strength. Before he could whirl around and bring his fists to bear, someone landed a punch on his kidney. He doubled over as the rest of the mob closed in. Someone kicked him in the back of the knee, dropping him to the ground. He felt kicks and blows raining down on his body from all directions. He curled into a ball, covered his head, and closed his eyes. He might have been able to stand up and get a few punches in before they ended him, but Simon decided to lie there and take the punishment. He figured he deserved it for what his wife had done and for not finding a way to stop her. Her sins were his sins. He should have noticed something was off with her and found a way to protect the innocents. Their blood was on his hands, just as if he'd been the one pulling the trigger that day. Then, out of nowhere, the beating stopped in an instant when the sky opened up and it started to rain. But not just any rain. This precipitation brought with it a foul smell, the kind that makes you want to turn your head away. He opened his eyes and tried to look around, but all he could see was red dripping across his vision. He thought at first it was blood. He pulled his shirt to his eyes and wiped them clean, but when he opened them again, everything was still red. Not blood, he decided. Plus, it didn't smell like blood. More like rotten eggs mixed with a dirty ashtray. The people surrounding him stood with craned necks, staring at the sky with looks of bewilderment on their mugs and hands covering their noses and mouths. It was a sludgy, putrid-smelling rain, a red rain, something straight out of a science fiction novel. They were covered in it, and so was everything around them, the street, the buildings, the cars. One of them gagged and another puked, sending the rest of the mob into a coughing fit. Simon hated the odor, too, but it wasn't making him sick. He didn't understand their overreaction, but perhaps they were more susceptible to it. Then again, it may have been his extensive military and intelligence training kicking in. His mind was strong, and so was his body, honed through years of practice. Above the steady hiss of the drops, the roar of an engine and the squeal of tires came at him, originating from the boulevard to the south. A few seconds later, a cargo van slid to a stop at the edge of the crowd, and the side door flew open. The young girl from outside the theater, the one in the black hoodie with the red hair and bright blue eyes, called to him. Redfall, quick, get in. Me? No, the other Simon Redfall. Yes, you genius. He froze, trying to think it through. Get in before these people remember they were in the middle of beating you to death. She screamed at him. Simon came to his senses. He limped with aching ribs through the stunned crowd, stumbling to the all-white van. The girl slammed the door shut behind him after he crawled in head first. The driver, a teenage boy, gunned the engine, sending the van forward in a lurch as they sped off. Chapter 6 Jeffrey Hansen, founder and CEO of Rain Tech, paced back and forth behind the single technician seated at the control console, waiting for an answer. His eyes floated up out of boredom, looking at the curved ceiling with a prideful gaze. 
It was made of thick plexiglass, reinforced by organic polymers created by Raintech for use in the newest class of U.S. Navy submarines. The Navy didn't know Raintech had withheld the best versions of its proprietary design for use in its own facility in the Bahamas, far beneath the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, along the southern edge of the Bermuda Triangle. Hell, Hansen thought, the Navy didn't know about his deep water research facility either. What the Navy didn't know could fill volumes, and he often thought that was the way they wanted it. Plausible deniability across the board. All his team had to do was deliver what the senior swabbies needed, and they'd look the other way. Or maybe they wouldn't bother looking. He wasn't sure, and didn't care. Everyone had an agenda, and the Navy commanders were no different. Best of all, he could triple his normal profit margins and still come in as the lowest bidder on their contracts, thanks to his inside man in the Department of Defense. Hansen stopped directly behind the technician and exhaled in frustration. He was tired of waiting. What's the delay, O'Neill? Where's my status report? Tim O'Neill's face glowed blue as the raw data from the deployment system marched across the computer screen. Just coming in now, sir. Operation Trident proceeding on schedule, the technician said. You were correct, boss. Looks like everyone was glued to the broadcast from the NEC. Drones Alpha through Omega weren't detected, and I can confirm full dispersal over each of the designated targets. Hansen smiled in satisfaction. The drones had released fast-acting weather control nanospores, codenamed Trident, at key locations around the globe. The effect had been almost instantaneous, because Raintech had prepared the atmosphere patiently over two decades, using a combination of military transports, private planes, and unmanned drones to spread its proprietary seed chemicals, which had since become part of the Earth's water cycle, in the air. Most civilians thought the contrails in the sky were the random emissions of passenger airliners and military aircraft, not the work of his seed craft. The few conspiracy theorists who'd realized something was going on had it partially right. They claimed Big Brother was engineering the weather in order to cause worldwide drought, with the end game of controlling the world's population through regulation of food and water sources. Raintech's PR department had leaked that misinformation through back channels over the years to bolster their theories, just to keep them busy and guessing. Everyone loves a good conspiracy theory. The underground media and the bloggers ate that shit up. His all-time favorite was Alex Stone of Shadow Wars fame. One covert tip and his lies would spread like clockwork. Fools. Where's my video confirmation? Hansen asked. Coming up on the big screen now, the technician reported, tapping a pair of keys. The image came to life on the 10 by 20 foot bank of screens above the control console. Hansen watched the live camera feed from a drone circling at high altitude above the mid-Atlantic region of the United States. It showed a massive red storm centered over Washington, D.C. and spreading like a replicating virus. The storm had already completely covered the capital city and was expanding quickly in all directions. Watch your flight path, son. The electromagnetic field powering the nanostorm will down our asset, and I don't think your paycheck will cover it. Roger that, the tech said, moving his hands and fingers quickly to change the drone's course. To the north, Baltimore was almost completely covered under the blood-red downpour, and to the south, its leading edge had reached the outskirts of Richmond. The storm would cover the entire east coast of the United States in a few hours, and by the following morning, it would reach inland as far as St. Louis and Chicago. By the time Trident was finished, North America would be smothered under a thick blanket of red, all of it engineered and controlled by rain tech. Hansen's eyes lit up with dollar signs. His well-funded client and his board of directors would be pleased, adding another $41 billion in profits to the coffers his corporation's single biggest contract to date. Switch to satellite. Give me a wide-angle view. Yes, sir, O'Neill replied. He typed a series of commands, and the screen split into four images, each showing roughly one quarter of the globe. Hansen watched as red sections eased across the display, 
slinking along the edges of every continent on Earth. The red rain had arrived. Good work, O'Neill, Hansen said, taking a Ruger pistol from his waistband. He held it an inch from the back of the technician's head and pulled the trigger. O'Neill's face exploded in a spray of blood and brain matter as he slumped forward onto the control console. Hansen pushed the body aside, then keyed in the self-destruct sequence for the detachable underwater control pod. He hurried to the compression hatch, got into the waiting one-man submarine, and plotted a course for an island two nautical miles to the east. He navigated the sub over the deep water testing facility, a massive underwater complex which spread for hundreds of yards across the seafloor. Large and small biodomes were scattered like eggs in a chicken coop, connected by corridors resembling cables lying in the sand. The handful of observation domes were made of clear plexiglass and well lit. Others were made of gray metal, thick, contoured, and shielded to keep his highly classified work a secret from surface detection. The research station was empty at the moment, and it was no accident. He'd given his entire research team and support staff the week off, except for O'Neill, and done so in the form of a surprise getaway cruise. He'd told the group it was a well-earned bonus for their roles in generating record profits the previous fiscal year. Of course, his story was a ruse. He needed them out of the way for today's classified deployment. Hansen had burned through a pile of cash, arranging the all-expenses-paid getaway for his team, but it was well worth it. His careful planning and execution would only cost him the expense of a cruise for 47 loyal employees, a detectable control pod, and, of course, the life of Tim O'Neill. Minimal loss for maximum profits, an excellent return on investment. He kept a close eye on the sub's rear-facing camera, and when the control pod exploded and then collapsed in on itself, he smiled. Mission accomplished. All that remained now was to collect his massive payday and disappear into the chaos that would soon sweep the planet. Chapter 7 Simon leaned against the back door of the van, panting heavily. His body ached all over. It had been years since he'd taken a beating, and he'd forgotten how much he disliked it. He was used to being on the winning side of physical altercations. Once his breathing calmed down, he noticed a soft thrumming on the roof and remembered the rain. Blood-red rain falling from blood-red thunderstorms. What the hell was going on out there? He brought his attention to the red-headed girl, then looked around at the rest of the vehicle's cargo space. Forget what is going on outside, he thought. What the hell is going on in here? The walls of the van were lined with high-tech instrument panels and sophisticated computer equipment. A monitor to his right displayed a familiar picture. A picture of him. One he hadn't seen in years. It was the photo his marketing manager had forced him to take and post on their corporate website. The website the same marketing manager had forced him to create and publish online for Ghostworks would-be investors. The picture made him uncomfortable, and so did taking the company public at the time. He didn't like losing control of anything, and was much more at ease being the guy with one leg up on the competition and the intel in any given situation. And yet, here he was, at a disadvantage to two kids who appeared out of nowhere and saved his hide. You okay, Simon? Tally asked. She sat on a small stool bolted to the floor of the van in front of the screen displaying his picture. Yeah, I guess, he replied. I got some pretty bad bruises. He examined his arms and pulled up his t-shirt to reveal several black and blue marks in the shape of boot treads. But I don't think anything is broken. I was afraid we were too late. If it wasn't for that rain, I think they might have beaten you to death. Who were they anyway? Simon gave her a downtrodden look, wanting to get his point across. Families of the victims, mostly. The girl gave him a blank look. Tessa's victims, he said, not wanting to go into more detail. Oh, right, she said, pausing for a moment. Your wife, sorry. Yeah, me too. And the rest? 
Drunks, looking for an excuse to start some shit, I'm guessing. Not that it matters. Executions will do that, she said. The producers of that show really know how to jack up the crowd. It's a wonder more fights didn't break out in the crowd. Show? She shrugged. Simon paused. Listen, I appreciate the rescue, but I think we should cut to the chase. I guess I should thank you for saving me first, but what I really want to say is, who are you? What do you want with me? Yes, you should thank me. I mean us, but you don't have to because I didn't, we didn't, she gestured to the driver, save you out of the goodness of our hearts. I don't think I like the sound of that. I'm afraid you're not going to like the sound of much of what I have to say. The entire world is fucked, the driver said over his shoulder, and now it's raining blood. Sinister words coming from the mouths of babes, Simon said, feeling the words drip from his lips like the blood dripping from the gash on his elbow. What did you say your names were? We didn't, the girl replied, and we're not children. Really? Could have fooled me. No, we're not. I'm 17, the driver said. Simon tried not to laugh. There was a long pause as he and the redhead stared at one another. He broke the silence. Okay, then. If you're not going to tell me who you are, then just pull over and let me out. You know who I am, but I don't know who you are. That dynamic isn't going to work for me. Not on any level. So, driver, Simon called to the front of the van. Thanks for the ride, buddy, but I need you to pull over. Anywhere will be fine. My name is Tally Wicky, the girl said. You can call me Wix. My friend up there is G. G? For security purposes, we go by nicknames. Only I know the true name of everyone. Except now I know yours, Miss Tally Wicky, and so does G. He's my second in command, and besides, everyone in our group knows my name. However, my name will be the only name you learn, Mr. Simon Redfall. G is for genius, the teenager said in an excited voice, breaking the tension in the van. The vehicle took a sharp right-hand turn, skidding around a corner and picking up speed on the on-ramp to I-95. Easy there, genius. No sense in saving my life if you're just going to kill me around the next curve. Maybe you should let an adult take the wheel until you get a learner's permit. Hey, hold on. We saved your ass, Redfall. Maybe I should just power open those doors and let you fall out the back? Take it easy, G. Just get us to Pandora in one piece, Tally scolded. Simon wasn't sure he'd heard her correctly. He wondered if he had been hit on the head during the beating after all. Pandora? he asked. Like the box? It's my compound, Tally replied in a more solemn voice than before. A compound? Seriously? Yes, it's a wondrous place, filled with like-minded individuals. You mean like-minded kids? Sure, if you feel the need to label us. Where is it? Pennsylvania, western part of Lancaster County. Isn't that Amish country? It is. How do you decide on that name? It was the name of my grandma's favorite book, an ancient text she read to me every night before bedtime. He smirked. Don't think I ever read that one. G spoke up, interrupting the conversation. How could you? Not when only three copies are known to exist in the world today. It takes someone with serious cash to afford a read like that, and I'm guessing that's not you. Simon found G's know-it-all tone a little off-putting. Wait, check that. He found it downright insulting, since he'd been extremely wealthy before his wife went off the rails and took everything away from him. His savings, his successful company, and his reputation. All that was left now was a scraggly street bum with sore ribs. Tally continued, shooting a disapproving look at G. The book is sort of a roadmap to the end of the world and what to do in preparation. You know, a back-to-the-basics prepper's handbook type thing, even though it was written over a hundred years ago. Let's face it, living a subsistence life and living off the land never really changes. Simon wanted to laugh, but didn't. He sat quietly and listened. Grandma was a former biochemist, and Grandpa was former military. Together, they were an amazing couple and true patriots. But as time went on, they began to fear the end of days was coming. You know, the great apocalypse. One thing led to another, and they decided to use the money from Grandma's patents to create a self-sustained compound in the country. Our whole family lived there and trained. Lived? He asked her, noticing the past tense word. My parents died when I was really young, leaving my grandparents to raise me and my brother. So, exactly how old are you? 
Simon asked the girl, wondering what level of pubescent ideology was calling the shots. Almost 23. Simon exhaled, resisting the urge to roll his eyes. He couldn't put his finger on it, but there was something endearing about this young lady. It wasn't just her confidence or connection to the moment. It was something else. He just wasn't sure yet what that something was. Mr. Redfall, Tally began. Call me Simon, please. My old man was Mr. Redfall. Okay, Simon. Look, like G reminded you, we just saved you from what was sure to be a major beating, maybe even a fatal one at that, so please, hear me out. You owe us that, at least. He nodded, keeping his lips silent. The way I see it, we need your help, and you need a place to lay low and recuperate. And now, with this red rain falling, who knows what's going to happen next? Trust me, even before this red storm, something sinister was at play, and we need your help to stop it. The world needs your help. All I ask is that you give me the benefit of the doubt and let me explain. If you decide you don't want to join us... Us? There's more of you? Yes, eight in total, counting me. His tactical sense was hungry for more facts. Eight? Is that with or without your grandparents? Without? They died five years ago, and I took over. He tilted his head, letting his analytical skills chew on the information, but he kept quiet and let the girl continue. Everything was in place for me and my brother to continue their work. That's when I started recruiting. He gave her an inquisitive stare, trying to wrap his head around the family's history. Like I said before, we need your help. However, if you decide you don't want to join us, we'll drop you off anywhere you like, and you can go back to your life. I don't actually have much of a life at the moment, but I think you already know that. I do. Your life is that of a drifter. A hated drifter, no less. Not much of a life, if you ask me. A complete waste of all that experience and skill. Wouldn't you rather make a difference in this world, or possibly make amends for what your wife did? Isn't that why you've been moving from city to city, denying yourself the basic pleasures of life while helping out at various homeless shelters? We know about the Eleven Habitat for Humanity builds and the lean-tos in the forest. Come on, Simon. Is this all there is? She didn't talk like a 22-year-old. That much was clear. Obviously, she was well-schooled and sharp and seemed to know what she wanted. How do you know all this? He asked, studying her facial response for clues. That's where G comes in, she said in a confident tone. Techno voodoo, G quipped, removing his hands from the steering wheel to crack his knuckles. He turned his head for a moment and sent a huge grin at Simon. It's all out there, if you know where and how to look. How being the key. Eyes on the road, Simon shot back. So I ask again, Simon, do you want more? Tally asked. He didn't want to admit it, but Tally was right. His life was shit, and he was tired of living in the dirt, creeping around like a slug. If the recent mob attack was any indication, Tessa's death was not the end of the ordeal. There would always be those who wanted him dead and would never be satisfied with anything less. He hoped their hatred would have lessened once she was gone, but just because he wanted it to happen didn't mean it would. Just wishful thinking. The future would always mean a life on the run, living in another makeshift shelter and staying off the radar. There would be times when he'd need sanctuary, food, and possibly medical attention. He did have a few friends remaining in the intelligence community, but they were probably too busy with more important things. And certainly, they wouldn't want to stick their necks out for someone as infamous as him, at least not yet. He'd need to redeem himself and reclaim a footing in the intelligence community first. While it was true he needed and wanted more from his life, he still felt compelled to make amends. The guilt was eating at him, even after Tessa's death. Sleeping through the night had been a major problem in the past couple of years, and it seemed likely his insomnia would continue. Every night, the faces of Tessa's victims would visit him, having taken permanent root in his synapses. All of it was an emotional drain. He felt like he'd been swimming in quicksand ever since Tessa opened fire. He thought the layers of torment would start to ease once she'd paid for her sins with her very last breath, but so far they hadn't. In fact, it felt like his inner turmoil had gotten worse, thickening 
with each breath he took. He didn't understand why. Simon, so what's it going to be? I need to know. Will you keep an open mind and hear me out? He cleared his throat and gave in. Okay, I'm all ears. Tally's eyes lit up. She opened her mouth to speak, but then her cell phone buzzed. She pulled it, looked at the screen, and then turned to Simon. I gotta take this. I was supposed to check in five minutes ago, but I got a little bit distracted. Hold that thought. She waved her fingers above the phone screen, then held it to her ear. Go for Wix. Hi, Dre. Sorry, we had a little change of plans on our end. She listened for a moment before speaking again. Yes, it's raining here. We're driving in it. I don't know, but it's everywhere. Save some samples for me. Please, it'll only take a minute to do. Just ask Dixie for help. Simon lost interest in the rest of her phone conversation. He closed his eyes and waited, letting the insanity of the day fester in his mind. Tessa's death. The beatings. Two youngsters with a van full of sophisticated equipment and a prepper compound in Amish country called Pandora. He shook his head. Never in his wildest dreams. Chapter 8 Zeke Olson watched the rotating series of satellite weather maps on the monitor. He studied them closely, watching the red storms grow larger as they spread across the planet slowly. He put the tip of his finger to the screen and tapped it. Indigo's face reappeared, flashing his toothy white smile. Vito tipped his hat. How did you know this was going to happen? Zeke asked him. Let's just say I have eyes and ears everywhere. I've told you before, money and weapons are not power. They're fleeting and useless under most circumstances, like with what we're seeing today. True power comes from the accumulation of knowledge and access to information. IndigoNet gives me that power on an unprecedented scale, especially now, with the runaway proliferation of smart devices in recent years. If one can sift through enough data and process it, even the future can be anticipated. Do you know what's going on? Zeke asked his flamboyant leader. I do, but I doubt the world's leaders have a clue. But none of that is your concern right now. Let me handle it. I understand. And Zeke? Yes, boss? Indigo cleared his throat, hesitating before he spoke again. There's one more thing we need to discuss. Anything you need, I'm at your service. I appreciate that. I know I can always count on you, but what we need to talk about isn't about today's agenda, per se. It's about the future. Yours and mine. With everything that's about to happen, there's always the possibility that one of us might not be here in the near future. Thanks to our inept leaders around the world and other nefarious organizations, human civilization is about to descend into chaos. Zeke's mouth ran dry when he heard those words, making it hard to answer. What do you mean, not be here? I mean, I'm not getting any younger. If something were to happen to me... I want you to take control of Indigo Tech as CEO to ensure all of my projects and plans are carried out to the letter. Legal has already drawn up the contingency paperwork. Everything has been signed and executed and is ready to take effect should such an event take place. Everything would transfer to you, including my seat on the board of directors. That includes every share of stock, every asset I own, and everything else I leave behind. Zeke was shocked not knowing how to deal with this shift in topics. Are you ill, sir? Is there something I should know? That's not important right now. What is important is that I've taken steps to ensure Indigo Technologies continues to live on and change the world as I planned. I trust you, Zeke. I know that in your more than capable hands, my company will continue to thrive. Again, all of this is a contingency plan if something unfortunate were to happen. Thank you, boss. I'm not sure what to say. No need to say anything. I'm more than pleased that I have someone like you to take over and run all that I've built in my stead. I never got around to having children or getting married, but my legacy will live on through you. I appreciate the confidence, sir. Whatever you need, I'm there for you. What would you like me to do? Remain where you are 
until these storms are finished. Then, either I or my lead attorney, Calder Stanton, will contact you with further instructions. There was a low rumbling in the wall to Zeke's right. Two sections of the carved wooden panels slid up and disappeared into the ceiling, revealing two rooms. One was a bedroom, furnished with a small bed and chest of drawers across from an entertainment center and oversized leather recliner. The other was a kitchen, equipped with a sink, a dishwasher, a refrigerator freezer, a small multi-purpose oven, and a table built for one. Cabinets lined the back wall, stacked with dishes and stuffed to the edges with packages of pre-made food and other staples for survival. Indigo was a master strategist and a thorough planner, but all of this seemed a bit excessive, even for him. For how long, Chief? Do you have somewhere to be, Zeke? Zeke had no family and no friends. He dedicated his entire adult life to his boss's empire. Indigo surely knew he had nowhere to be and nowhere to go. Zeke wondered if his boss was frustrated by his question, or perhaps was taking a verbal poke at him. He decided to play it straight, like he always did. He couldn't afford to mess up his high-paying gig or his planned inheritance, not over something as mundane as this. Of course not, boss. I'm dutifully at your service, as always. Indigo laughed, albeit softly. There are enough food stores on site there for a month. Just let my handy Mark II know what you want and he'll whip it together for you. But I hope you won't be here anywhere close to that long. As do I, Zeke added wondering how he was going to pass the time, other than chatting with a voiceless butler bot. With all that was just dumped on his plate, the minutes would seem like hours until future events unfolded, whatever that meant. I don't think you have anything to worry about. I'll keep you out of harm's way, and you'll be well taken care of, as has always been the case. For now, I need you to relax and enjoy yourself. Think of it as an impromptu vacation. You've earned it, number two. Thank you for always having my back. Zeke relished the new title. Number two. He'd come a long way since his days as an underpaid, underappreciated science teacher at a rural high school in northern Arizona, trying to make ends meet by selling a little real estate on the side. Life was good right now, and he would gladly take a bullet for the man who showed him how to succeed in life and in business. When brilliant entrepreneurs like Gates, Jobs, and Musk forcibly climbed their way to the top, they usually made a slew of enemies along the way. That was normal and to be expected, for most men. However, Indigo was different. Everyone seemed to like and respect Vito, allowing him to push deals through against any opposition. He always seemed to know exactly what buttons to push and when, and that held true at every level of business whether he was dealing with President Cooper of the United States or some poor landscaper scratching out a living under the blistering sun of downtown Phoenix. Vito Indigo had a real talent for unification, despite being driven by a single agenda, minting money. He could connect people in a way that seemed to defy explanation and then convince them to join his venture. Offer them something of value, something they can't live without and do it with a smile. They'll agree to just about anything. But first, you must do your homework and identify the key item that'll allow you to use their own greed and desperation against them. They'll be so focused on obtaining what they crave, they'll never see you coming, Vito would preach to him. Remember to divide and conquer through compartmentalization and misdirection, the latter of the two being the most effective weapon in any strategist's arsenal. It's how magicians fleece the audience of their hard-earned money. Zeke was diligent to pay close attention to each word that came out of his boss's mouth, soaking in every nuance of negotiating and consensus building, hoping to someday emulate the tycoon. And it appeared that someday might just be around the corner. Indigo tilted his head toward the bedroom. The entertainment center is loaded with all the shows and movies you'll ever need. I've picked out some of my favorites for you. I hope you don't mind. You'll find the universal remote in the top drawer on the right. Wow, totally unexpected, but thank you. Indigo flashed a toothy smile, taking over the screen with white. And Zeke? 
You might want to check the refrigerator first. Before Zeke could respond, Indigo's image disappeared and was replaced by the map showing the spread of storms. He studied their progress, noticing they'd grown larger in the short period he'd been talking to his boss. If they kept expanding at this rate, they'd cover. He stopped his train of thought. Indigo had told him he didn't have anything to worry about, so he turned his mind to other things, as was expected of him. Never question the man cutting the paychecks, or the man who's about to leave you his entire empire. He clicked the monitor off, then pushed the roller chair back and went to the kitchen. He opened the refrigerator to see what Vito had been talking about. A stash of Coors Light filled the bottom shelf, while two ceramic dishes covered in foil waited for him up top. Each aluminum wrap had been emblazoned with the logo from his favorite restaurant, Maxims of Paris. He took the plates, uncovered them, and put them on the table. His mouth began to water at the sight of his favorite meal, chilled tofu marinated in balsamic vinegar, a side of roasted new potatoes, and a heaping bowl of garden salad smothered in ranch dressing. Indigo was right. Zeke was taken care of on every level, and best of all, paid handsomely in the process. All the CEO expected was unadulterated loyalty and steadfast follow-through, two things that any motivated man would provide, given the circumstances, especially a single man with nothing to lose. It was starting to appear that Zeke's years of dedicated service were about to pay off handsomely. He'd miss talking and working with Vito. His boss was a good man and a more than capable mentor. Gotta love the internet, he mumbled, thinking about how he blindly stumbled across the hidden employment advertisement on the Asian dating website he'd joined at the time. A site he never would have been surfing if he'd been married, spawned any kids, or had a stitch of family to lean on during the loneliest of days. He never thought he'd ever say these words, but being completely alone in the world had its perks. Zeke often wondered if his life of solitude was the reason for his initial hire, meaning he and Indigo had something fundamental in common. No family, no children, and nobody around to get in the way of business. Kindred spirits, at least on the surface, because there were definitely some differences. Zeke was a simple man. Indigo was not. But in the end... It was all about the art of the deal. Vito was a unique blend of the unexpected, running to his own beat at all times. The man never seemed to sleep and was always on his game, making him unstoppable and completely unpredictable. The competition never knew what Indigo was thinking, and neither did Zeke, making it impossible for anyone to anticipate his next move. This was what made Vito ultra-successful around the world with everything he touched. Zeke was proud to be number two on the Indigo team. A team that felt like home. A warm, comfortable blanket meant just for him. A blanket worth trillions. Chapter 9 Simon lifted himself from his spot against the back doors of the van and moved to the stool in front of the computers. Tally had just finished her call with Dre back at Pandora. Everything okay? he asked. Yes. They're surprised you're with me, though. This was only supposed to be a meet-and-greet mission, initial contact only. But then, well, you know, things went a little sideways. Violent, angry mobs can do that, Simon said. And the red rain, G added. Tally nodded. Exactly. Well, anyway, I told them we still don't know if you'll actually join our team or not. This day hasn't exactly gone according to plan. For you and me both, Simon said, pausing to reflect. Go ahead, lay it on me. I don't see how anything could surprise me at this point. You sure you're ready? I really don't like to repeat myself. You have my attention. For how long is up to you. Tally paused and looked over at G. He looked back at her and nodded. She took a deep breath to compose herself, Simon guessed, and gave him a dramatic look as she said, Something big is developing in the shadows, and we need your help to stop it. Big? What do you mean big? Are you talking about a government conspiracy? 
If so, let me save you the time, young lady. I've heard him all before. Trust me, working in the intelligence field exposes you to everything under the sun. Most of the time, if not all of the time, it's a complete waste of energy and resources. So if this is some adolescent fantasy involving aliens or government cover-ups, then just pull over and let me out now. I'm not interested in joining a band of fanatics. She looked a little stunned and like she was about to cry. No, it's nothing like that. We're not lunatics or fanatics. How can you even say that? You don't know me or my team. I'm sorry. I may have been a little harsh. Oh yeah, you could say that, G quipped from his seat. Well then, explain it to me. I'll keep an open mind, he told Tally. She hesitated, looking down for a moment. Then she spoke. We're watchers, seekers of the truth, all of it stemming from my grandparents, who were biochemists and deep thinkers. My parents were scientists, too. Dad was a physicist and Mom a biologist, but they died when I was little, so I never really knew them, not like I did my grandparents. I'm sorry, I didn't know. It was a long time ago. How old were you? Seven. That's hard, at any age. It was. I know what it's like to lose someone important. Seeing your wife die like she did must have been awful to watch. Simon thought about the crushing grief when he'd learned of Tessa's murderous violence. That type of wound never really goes away. It sits there and ferments until it either consumes you or you consume it. He needed to write Tessa off as a dead person. Dead to him, at least. The execution had been the first step to finding closure, yet more work needed to be done. As difficult as this had been on him, he couldn't imagine what Tally had been through, dealing with such tremendous loss at a very young age. So, you went to live with your grandparents at Pandora? Yes, but it wasn't called Pandora back then. It was just my grandparents' farm when they took us in. The name change came later. Us? Me and my younger brother. After my parents died, that's when Grandma and Grandpa decided to become big-time preppers. Met a few of them in my day. Seems like everywhere you turn these days, people are preparing for the collapse of civilization. There's a lot of nut jobs out there. Some more than others, but not us. But that's not really important at the moment. What's important is my family taught me science. They taught me to live by verifiable facts to gather evidence and make logical conclusions, all while doing my best to stay unbiased. The reason I need your help... We need your help, G added with a sharp tone. Yes, we need your help. We've uncovered some startling information while looking into the facts surrounding my parents' death. And what might that be? I don't think their death was an accident, like I was told when I was little. I read the newspaper stories and got curious. I noticed their deaths were a part of a trend, a disturbing trend. That's when I brought G in to help. Voodoo, baby, voodoo, he touted from the front seat. Really? What kind of trend? Simon asked her. Scientists have been disappearing for the past 20 years. Disappearing? And dying. Some of the best and brightest in the world. Dying in car accidents, plane crashes, sudden illnesses, suicide, you name it. Others vanish completely and are never heard from again. Yet, the weird thing is, they still file taxes. Does any of that seem normal to you? He didn't want to agree with her. Not yet. What kinds of scientists? The first group seemed to be concentrated in the biochemistry and biotech fields. After that, scientists in meteorology, atmospheric sciences, agricultural meteorology, and climatology went missing. Then, some physicists and mathematicians vanished, and even a few from neuropharmacology and biological psychology, though we're not sure they're related to the trend. Hmm, he said, sifting through her statements. Those were big words from such a small girl, but she might be onto something. That does seem too highly concentrated to be random. Yes, very suspicious, if you ask me. My voodoo never lies, G shouted from the driver's seat. How much voodoo? Simon asked the young tech. Several gigaquads? My infobots have been crawling the net for months, accumulating mountains of data. I've built mega indexes for cross-referencing tons of facts and events. Indigo Tech has nothing on me. Do you think someone is killing them off? Simon asked Tally. 
I don't know, maybe. Or faking their deaths and forcing them to do work against their will? The end game is unclear. It's tough to know what's real and what's not when the media, the military, and the government lie at every turn. So, we dig through it on our own. We've put together a few theories, but that's where I need help. I need someone with the experience to help put it all together. We're seeing these trends, but what it all means, well, like you said, it all sounds a little nuts. I need another pair of eyes, Simon. Someone to look over my shoulder, help me sift through the facts, analyze the data, and tell me I'm not crazy. Then maybe help me do something about it. Okay, but why me? Because you're unique, and obviously know how to live off the grid and survive. You were in the military, you worked in intelligence, and then you worked in the private sector. Your company provided security services for high-tech, experimental government and military facilities, right? That's all classified, but yes. Ghostworks provided security and tactical threat assessment for both governmental and military facilities, at least until they fell into bankruptcy. Which means that you've seen things from the inside, from the ground up. You know people. You have connections that can take you places that I, that we could never go. Put that together with your real-world experience. I mean, let's face it. You've been on this planet a lot longer than I have. I may be young, but I'm old enough to know that experience counts. Grandpa taught me the best leaders surround themselves with the best and brightest. Like me, G shouted as he made a turn. Yes, like G. Look, nobody knows it all. We all need help once in a while. You, me, G, it doesn't matter. We can't survive on the planet alone. Leaders are only as good as the people around them. That's why I'm here. I need your help, Simon. We need your help. We have so much to show you. It's crazy stuff. But first, you have to commit. And I mean an all-in type thing. If word ever got out about the data we've uncovered, a Reaper drone would be over Pandora in a heartbeat. Like opening Pandora's box, he said in a mumble, thinking her offer over. Two decades of missing scientists. He was intrigued. And he was starting to like Tally. She was smart, mature beyond her years. She'd suffered loss, which made him feel connected to her. Loss changes you, makes you stronger. He could feel the draw. Something was stirring inside him, something which he hadn't felt since his wife had gone haywire and took his empire down. The lure of Tally wasn't sexual. It was more along the lines of a deep respect for critical thinking and his need to belong to something a cause to fight for, a reason to exist. He missed being a part of a team and being connected to other people. He wanted to feel human again. That's a lot to process, he told her, taking his time to consider everything. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Tell him, Wicks, G snapped, pounding his hand on top of the dashboard like an anxious warrior before a battle. There's been a movement over the past five years or so, mostly in weather-related fields, which all seems to lead to a company called RainTech. What kind of movement? First, scientists getting pulled from government jobs with the National Weather Service and going to work for RainTech. Then, about a year later, they drop off the map. It's like their lives have been erased. He nodded slowly. Now, when you combine that with missing shipments of high-tech chemicals and materials, it raises a few red flags. We've managed to track down a few shipping manifests, and they seem to always end up at one of the facilities owned by RainTech. Then today, this red rain, which we didn't see coming. But it has to be related. How can it not? And you say you have evidence for all of this. Real documentation. Hard copy that I can look over. It's all digital, dude. Seriously, who uses paper anymore? G said. Yes, it's all back in Pandora secured behind firewalls on isolated servers, but we can print some of it out if it makes you feel more comfortable. I'm sure G has a working laser printer in storage somewhere. Simon was more than intrigued. He'd come across his share of conspiracy theorists in his time, but this pair took the cake. His mind flashed the face of an infamous talk show host, Alex Stone, on Shadow Wars, then erased it just as quickly. But Tally didn't have the same feel as that rabble-rouser. She was grounded. She didn't have the glow of fanaticism in her eyes that seemed to be so prevalent in the untrained prepper and end-of-the-world circles. And she was right about something else, which was eminently practical. 
he needed a place to recuperate from his injuries. Well, she asked, what do you say? Will you help us? Not sure yet. I need to think it over. However, I'll go with you to your camp and have a look at the evidence. Then I'll decide. That's the best I can do right now. Fair enough. But there's one more thing, Tally said. Yeah? And what's that? We don't think your wife was responsible for gunning down all those people. Chapter 10 Zeke Olson finished the last mouthful of the to-go order his boss had provided from the upscale restaurant in Paris. He gave the empty plate and soiled flatware to the butler bot humming nearby and returned to the video monitoring station in the main room where he planned to watch the latest news about the red storms. The rolling chair was waiting for him several feet from its tucked under home position, which seemed odd since the Mark II had been worrying about the place on its own. He thought Vito's self-contained robot might have been cleaning and organizing the space to stay busy, but apparently not, leaving the chair exactly where he'd sent it rolling earlier. He sat down and turned up the sound on the monitoring station with a few finger swipes on what Vito had called the remote control. The device was an outdated Apple iPad tablet that had been repurposed for sentimental reasons, he guessed. All of Apple's gear had fallen into the recycle bin after the company's swift bankruptcy, thanks in no small part to Indigo Tech's new holographic sensor design. Touch screens and finger swipes were no longer all the rage. It was Indigo's new laser-sensed virtual interface that had everyone talking. It only took a handful of months for Apple's old-school tactile controls to fall out of favor with the civilian population and be replaced with Indigo's Digipad and its mid-air finger and hand twists, or twips. This is Nancy Lee, reporting live for Starbright News from a very strange scene, intoned the reporter on the screen. She held an umbrella in one hand and a microphone in the other. Zeke recognized the view behind her the classic south-facing shot of the narrow traffic island in the center of Times Square, with the towering Coca-Cola advertisement dominating the background. The reporter continued, I'm here live in the heart of New York City. As you can see, there are virtually no pedestrians out, and the only cars on the streets are a few Google cabs and police cruisers. It seems the residents of New York are heeding the no-travel order issued last night by Mayor Dickerson. That's spooky, seeing the city like that, Zeke mumbled. Zeke tapped the tablet, and the image changed abruptly to a red-faced female preacher standing in a pulpit, spewing religious fanaticism to anyone who'd listen. The end is near. What we see before us is a clear sign from the Heavenly Father. The time has come for each of us to answer for our earthly sins. Hell's tears are raining down upon us, washing over and through us with the blood of shame. Behold what the good book says in Isaiah. Drip down, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds pour down righteousness. My good people, the all-powerful and all-knowing Lord Almighty pours down His righteousness even now. And why is the rain the color of red, my brothers and sisters? Because red is the symbol of hellfire, as the good book says. The Lord will come in fire, and his chariots like the whirlwind, to render his anger with fury. Now we know the true meaning of these words, as sent down by God himself for all of mankind to heed. Repent, all ye sinners, for the end of days is upon us. The lights in the room flickered, and the screen went dark for a moment, then came back on, but not on the gospel-spinning preacher. It was a test screen. Vertical bars of yellow, blue, green, red, and purple filled the wall. A second later, the test screen went dark. Then the preacher came back on, red-faced and frothing. Zeke changed the channel immediately, looking for something more interesting. He found an elderly weatherman, with a heavy middle that sagged well below his belt line, standing before a satellite image of the United States. 
America was virtually unrecognizable. Red clouds covered the eastern and western sections. The storms from the Atlantic had moved inland, ending in a vertical front that stretched from Michigan to Alabama. In the west, the redness stretched from Montana in the north to the border of New Mexico in the south. As you can see by the directional arrows on the screen, the activity is not following any normal weather pattern. Most of us are familiar with the jet stream that typically flows across our country from west to east, but there are exceptions to this pattern, of course. For example, the dreaded nor'easters in New England that have plagued fishermen for as long as we've been recording the weather. But as the map shows, these storms are building and spreading like something else entirely. If the storms continue along their current track, we expect them to merge somewhere over the Midwest. Nobody can predict how long this strange weather might last, so keep your rain gear and umbrellas handy, folks. We might be in for a long couple of days. Zeke swiped two channels over, stopping on a news report being broadcast from New Orleans by a Hispanic woman dressed in rain gear and holding an umbrella. Her accent was thick, and so was her red lipstick. An FAA official confirmed the captain did report several passengers had suddenly become seriously ill during the flight headed for Dallas from Miami. The captain declared a medical emergency to the tower before receiving approval from flight control to alter course in anticipation of an immediate landing at the Baton Rouge Metropolitan Airport. However, communications were lost shortly after the pilot told the controller that the plane was experiencing a catastrophic malfunction after entering the leading edge of the rapidly building storm. All of the estimated 325 passengers aboard are assumed lost at this time, but FAA officials have been unable to confirm the passenger count due to an unexpected computer problem. Two more channels over, Zeke found a slender African-American man reporting from Junction City, Kansas. He was standing in front of the Atomic Cannon exhibit on top of a hill in Freedom Park. The camera feed changed to show thousands of dead birds lying around the area. The mystery continues as wildlife officials sort through the remains of an estimated 5,000 red-winged blackbirds who plunged to their death a short while ago as the massive flock flew west across the area. Alan Greenfield, co-founder of the Institute for Bird Sciences on the University of Kansas campus, told me in an earlier interview that the flock may have run into a string of power lines in the area, breaking their backs in mid-flight. However, what prompted the birds to fly into the power lines remains a mystery. Chapter 11 Jeffrey Hansen knew something was horribly wrong when the sub lost power halfway to his tropical destination. He was forced to initiate a manual emergency blow and rise to the surface, or he would have suffocated as the tiny craft sank to the sea floor. The cause of the power loss was unknown. One moment, he'd been cruising along at a depth of 250 feet, and the next moment, all the systems had gone dead. As he'd done countless times before, he'd performed a full, meticulous sweep of the sub before taking it under, and found nothing. All systems reported green. He'd been over it a dozen times in his head, leaving only one explanation. Sabotage and a subtle one at that. He finished his float to the surface and opened the hatch to resupply his air. It worked, but then he heard a noise that sent chills down his spine. The lawnmower-like whine of a Class IV Reaper drone overhead, closing in on him fast. A vast array of data points came together all at once, making him realize he needed to act immediately. Otherwise, he was a dead man. He located the UAV in the sky and watched in horror as a missile with a sleek airframe detached from its underside. He assumed it was an AGM-114L longbow, the hellfire of choice, able to lock onto its target using a number of seekers, even sound. Just fire and forget, the pinnacle of modern weaponry. The warhead fell under gravity, dropping a few yards before the rear-mounted propulsion system ignited. The ordnance stabilized under the power of its thrust, then the onboard guidance system took it on an intercept course with his submersible. Fear 
Panic and logic all came together as Hansen's body spun in the water and his hands grabbed the small emergency scuba tank and mask from the sub's single-seat cockpit. A deep breath came next, then a quick dive into the water. He started his descent, pushing his thighs and feet to their max. If the missile carried its standard warhead, he needed to reach a much deeper depth in order to escape the kill zone. He prayed the UAV had been retrofitted with the Griffin, a 13-pound substitute developed by his pals at Raytheon to limit collateral damage, giving him a slim chance to survive. A few seconds later, an explosion rocked the surface above him, taking out the sub. The shock wave passed through the water quickly, targeting his bones with incredible force. His ears rang and his head felt like it was going to split open, but he managed to hold on to the air tank and keep himself from floating back to the surface. His lungs screamed, making him desperate for air. The initial wave of disorientation made him think about swimming back to the surface, but his logic trumped the idea. He knew the aircraft would be circling overhead, waiting to eradicate any survivors. He knew this because he'd instructed his senior software engineers to code the tactical response into the drone's AI software, the same software that his company provided through a confidential escrow service to an unnamed defense contractor who was responsible for building the new top-secret Reaper drone arsenal. The survivor protocol stated that if no life signs appeared after five minutes, the UAV should fly on and send an encrypted status report to its handlers. Hansen struggled with the regulator in the dark, but finally managed to get it into his mouth. He took several small breaths, trying to keep his heartbeat in check. Slowly, his body filled with oxygen and his thoughts and emotions stabilized. First, the sub malfunction. Now, the Reaper attack. Someone obviously wanted him dead and was using some of his own tech against him. But who? The person who commissioned the Trident Project? The CIA? NSA? Russia? He'd made plenty of enemies along the way, so the list was long. He remained under the water for safety, while spending the next ten minutes crunching the facts. But his brain came up empty. It was time to get moving, with a two-mile swim ahead. There'd be plenty of time later to sort things out. His ascent approached the surface, hoping the drone's survivor protocols and timing hadn't been changed by whomever was after him. Hands broke through the water first, then his head, before buoyancy reached equilibrium. Now, bobbing neck deep in water, his eyes scanned the sky and waited. No sign of the Reaper or the trident storm clouds he'd unleashed on the world. All he saw was the ever-vigilant sun beaming bright above the horizon. The absence of storm clouds above meant the targeting vectors were working perfectly. The nanospores were programmed to hug the coastlines of the major land masses, using the warmer temperatures and air pressure change as a boundary marker, and cover everything inland from there. His demanding client wanted it that way. In fact, the project specs were adamant about it. Keep the atmosphere over the oceans clear at all costs. Well, that and deliver the project exactly on time, which was today. If his bearings were correct, he'd hit a small islands chain off the Bahamas if he kept swimming west. The same set of islands he'd been aiming before his sub was sabotaged and obliterated from above. He turned his attention to the matter at hand. Survival. To do that, he needed to formulate a to-do list. First on the list, make it to shore. Then find civilization and collect his payday so he could disappear for a while and live comfortably. He figured billions should accomplish that nicely. Once things cooled down, he could sneak back to the States and find out who wanted him dead. Once he tracked them down, he'd take his revenge. A swift, painful end for whomever wanted him dead. To do that, Hansen needed help from a trained intelligence operator, someone skilled in the art of information gathering, concealment, and evasion. Someone with the contacts and the IOUs to make his plan to get even a possibility.
but it would need to be someone desperate enough to help him. Someone he could shower with cash and someone who would take the job and see it through to the end, no matter what happened or what they learned along the way. The first name that popped into his head was an old CIA connection, Simon Redfall. A man who was both on the long list of people who wanted Hansen dead and on the short list of people Hansen would trust with his life. Sure, Redfall had his rough edges like everyone else, but he was, first and foremost, a man of his word. If Hansen could convince Redfall to help, Redfall would complete the mission, never allowing the festering need for payback to cloud his judgment or his ethics. At least, that was the man he knew a long time ago, long before Redfall's beautiful wife Tessa went postal on a group of unsuspecting scientists in broad daylight. There was no telling how those tragic events had affected Redfall in the days since. Even a rock-hard spook like Simon had his limits, and certainly his pressure points, like anyone else. Life had taught Hansen a great many things, one of which was how a rogue wife can transform a man. A rogue wife tortures her man, twisting his heart until the pain morphs him into something else. A rogue wife sets off a slew of emotional tripwires, causing a chain reaction that destroys the man from the inside out. It happens thousands of times every day across the planet, usually with some random co-worker or a sweet-talking asshole at the local pub. Rarely, though, does the wife go rogue on a busload of people with an assault rifle. At this point, it was possible only an empty shell of Redfall remained, someone who couldn't be bought off, reasoned with, or counted on for help. Chapter 12 Simon sat in the front passenger seat of the van, watching the rain pour across the countryside. It was more of a steady drizzle, really. His eyes studied the pattern of red drops hitting the windshield and then streaking off on their own before the wipers could come through and do their job. Given the texture and consistency of the red rain, he would have expected some type of buildup on the glass affecting the wipers during each swipe, but none of that was happening. He figured the kids must have applied rain to the windshield or some other type of silicone polymer. Or they may have simply cut a potato in half and rubbed the starch across the glass. Either would work and accomplish the same goal. He adjusted his position, trying to lessen the pain across his ribs and lower back. It worked, allowing him to breathe easier. The adrenaline from the gang attack and subsequent getaway had completely worn off, leaving his body screaming at him. He knew exactly where he'd been punched and kicked. Bruises were spreading on his arms, ribs, back, and legs, and his jaw was sore. But luckily, his head was clear for the most part. Tally, or Wix, Simon reminded himself, was now driving after a quick break at a truck stop to change positions. He needed to get used to the whole nickname thing if he decided to throw in with her group of... kids. Odd kids, and he'd only met two of them so far. A short while ago, they'd turned off I-95 a few miles past Baltimore and stopped to pee and change places after the first 90 minutes. G had gone straight to his bank of computers to scan news broadcasts and the internet for any news about the building storms. From what G had picked up, no one could explain what was going on, though one reporter did mention a few research groups had begun detailed analysis. The sun was buried behind the storm clouds, but Simon guessed that sunset would arrive in about 30 minutes. The unusual rain had been falling the entire time, even after they crossed the state line. Rolls of farmland ticked by the window, interspersed with homes, barns, and stands of trees, mostly bare of leaves and human activity. The landscape was cloaked in a red glow and he didn't expect that to change since the snarl of clouds stretched as far as he could see. It was eerie, almost surreal, as if he was starring in some end-of-the-world disaster movie. The last thing Wicks had said to Simon about Tessa's possible lack of guilt had speared him deep and hard. Back at the NEC, he'd given up hope for his wife, 
condemning her to hell like the billions who were watching the brutal execution on pay-per-view. His insides were a mess when she died, but now, after Tally's unexpected revelation, the pain in his gut had intensified tenfold. How could Tessa not be responsible for what she'd done? Simon wanted to know more, but hadn't found the proper words to ask. The van had been silent since they'd stopped to empty their bladders, and none of the passengers had brought up Tessa's name or what had happened at the NEC. He wasn't sure he had the strength to face it either, and he certainly didn't want to bare his soul to some kids he'd just met. He couldn't help himself, though. The words finally came to his tongue. Do you really think the missing scientists are connected to Tessa? He asked Tally, breaking the silence in the van. Yes, she answered after a short stammer. He must have caught her off guard with the sudden question about his wife. Then her eyes lit up with excitement. I do, and I bet this storm is connected to it all somehow, too. My grandparents told me for years that the government was working on controlling the weather, and lately I've started to believe it. Just think about it. All those contrails you see every day. Internet forums all over the world are reporting they're appearing over every major population center and have been for years. All of them seem to follow specific, repeating patterns, and for whatever reason, they just hang in the sky for hours. Contrails should dissipate quickly, not linger. And now this. It's all related. It has to be, she said, turning her head to G. What's the latest, G? Got anything new? The teenager brought his eyes up from the monitors. A pair of headphones were wrapped around his neck, with one of the speakers pressed against his ear. Yes and no. Reports are starting to come in from all over. More information about what's happening, but still nothing as to how or why. Everyone seems confused, and I don't blame them. What is this stuff? What are they saying? She asked. Identical drizzling storms everywhere, spitting out the same red goo. Everywhere? Simon interrupted. Yeah, worldwide. This is big. From what I can piece together, storms above each continent started at roughly the same time, beginning around the largest seaports and spreading inland from there, just like clockwork. They must be using the ocean air or humidity somehow to grow. None of this seems random, right? Doesn't seem likely, Simon answered. Shanghai, Singapore, Hong Kong, Los Angeles, Long Beach, New York, Houston, Havana, and the list goes on. I'm thinking the storms are going to merge over each landmass in about 24 hours, blocking out the sun and soaking everything. That's insane, Tally snapped. I know. I've been reading science journals since I was nine years old, and I have never heard of anything like this. I'd call it elegant if it wasn't so scary and completely unbelievable. And no one is saying anything? Tally asked G. Well, lots of people are saying lots of things, but as far as I can tell, they're basically making a bunch of crap up. Nobody has a clue. I heard one meteorologist say something about a red rain in Sri Lanka a few years ago, but that turned out to be an isolated biological incident. Nothing like this, though. Not even close. Any official statements? Simon asked, wondering if this was some type of biological weapon unleashed by a rogue nation. But why unleash it across the entire world, rather than just targeting a specific country or region? The only answer he could come up with was to cover the offending nation's tracks. Then again, it could be something else entirely. G's voice was now full of energy. Plenty of religious nuts are calling it the rapture, the end times, Armageddon, you name it, but nothing official yet. I keep expecting to see videos popping up on YouTube, you know, from doomsday terrorist organizations or freedom fighters claiming responsibility. Everywhere you turn, it seems like there's someone new calling us infidels or Satan, telling everyone how they brought on the rapture. Remember all the internet flack from Jade Helm 15? These guys come out of the woodwork once something unexpected happens. Simon turned to Tally. As crazy as all this sounds, the specific oddities of this global storm do lend support to some type of sweeping conspiracy theory. But until more facts present themselves, I'm not sure what to think. See? This is exactly why we need you. To help us with all things tactical and practical, she said with a slight grin. He let out an appreciative smile, recognizing her choice of words. All Things Tactical and Practical was the title of his failed how-to book, released on Amazon at the suggestion of his next-door neighbor at the time, Michael Banner. It was a total flop, but he had fun writing it. How far are we from your camp? He asked her. About 25 miles. The last mile and a half is on a crappy private dirt road. Really slow going. I'm afraid your ribs are going to feel every bump. Chapter 13 
Jeffrey Hansen dragged himself out of the surf after the two-mile swim, crawled up the beach, and collapsed between two palm trees. He rolled over on his back and looked up at the sky. The sun was starting to fade in the west, but the sky was clear. He was thankful Trident was programmed to hug the coastlines of the major continents where they'd been unleashed. If the storms had been spread over the oceans, he never would have been able to find the island by using the stars for navigation. The North Star kept him on course and kept him moving with singular purpose. He'd been in the water longer than he'd expected, and he was exhausted. The waves had turned choppy, leaving him to battle currents the entire way. He was lucky he'd started his swim south of his destination, otherwise he would have been swept north into the shipping lanes, ending up somewhere in the middle of the ocean, hundreds of miles off the coast of Florida. Fish bait or propeller chow, not that it mattered. He'd come ashore in a horseshoe-shaped cove. Above him, he could see an ancient stone building with three massive spires rising up from the cliff it sat on. Each white stone tower featured a shiny skull and crossbones affixed to its peak. He recognized the famous structure, now called Renegade's Mansion. It was on the southern tip of St. Bluff's Island. He knew the area well, having studied it before constructing his underwater research facility years ago. Fuck, he murmured. Wrong island. He wasn't sure where he'd planned to end up, probably swept off course by the ocean currents, but it would have to do. There were rumors the former castle had been converted into a lavish mansion by a notorious drug dealer, Carlos Santiago, a.k.a. Jigsaw. There was a small village lining the protected bay on the leeward side, populated solely by the dealer's servants and families. Word was out to avoid the island at all costs. The drug lord didn't take kindly to visitors. Visitors like him. A white American businessman with strong ties to the government and the military. Unreal, Hansen thought, realizing his luck had gone totally south. His vision of the massive payday for delivering Trident on time and on budget was evaporating by the second. He took a few deep breaths wanting nothing more than to fall asleep where he was and deal with his predicament in the morning. But he couldn't risk it. He had to find shelter and a place to hide for the night. There would be patrols, and they'd surely find him if he remained on the beach. He stood up and looked left, trying to plot a course to safety. Suddenly, machine gun fire erupted from a stand of underbrush thirty yards away. Bullets tore into the tree trunks around him as he dove to his belly and crawled to the closest cover he could find, a small sand dune held in place by a stunted tree with oval-shaped fruit hanging from its low branches. Now he knew why everyone avoided the island. It was deadly. Bullets churned up the sand on the opposite side of the dune. Hansen waited for a break in the fire. It came fifteen seconds later, but the expected sound of movement and voices didn't. He eased his head slightly above the crest in the dirt to see what he was up against. What he'd thought was a tropical thicket of brush earlier was nothing of the sort. It was a concealment blind for a motion-activated, automated defense system, hence no voices or human activity. Two sinister barrels began shooting rounds in his direction again. He ducked behind the dune again, hearing and feeling a stream of bullets whiz a few inches over his head. Hansen wondered why they hadn't opened fire when he first crawled onto the beach, then realized the answer was simple. Turtles. The local islands were breeding grounds for loggerhead turtles, which crawled out of the surf, laid eggs in the sand, then crawled back into the water. The gun turrets must have been programmed to open fire on anything above a certain height, probably 18 inches, he guessed, but ignore anything else. If he hadn't stood up, he wouldn't be taking fire. Crawling it is, then, Hansen decided. He slid farther down, behind the small rise in the sand, looking for a way around the sentry battery. To his left, there was a dense stand of imposing yucca plants. Their sharp spines would tear him to shreds within minutes if he chose that path. Only one option remained, the right flank. He'd have to hug the soft line of sand just beyond the reach of the water,
inching in front of the machine guns on his belly. He wasn't sure what was beyond, but he needed to get moving and work his way inland to find shelter. The gunfire surely caught the attention of someone on this island, and that meant trouble would soon arrive. Before he could move, he heard a familiar whine overhead. Drone? A drug dealer with drones? This guy takes his security seriously, Hansen thought. That meant crawling the shoreline was out. He'd be spotted from above easily. He thought quickly and realized he only had one option, assuming he could make it. It was a desperately bad idea, but the only one he could think of on short notice. He hopped to his feet and sprinted in a zigzag pattern across the beach, back toward the ocean surf where he'd come ashore. The machine guns opened up again, sending a flood of bullets that kicked up sand around him. The whine of the drone overhead got louder as the deadly surface fire ripped closer and closer. He felt a sharp, biting pain in his left shoulder, sending him spinning while splashing into the surf. He went to dive under the water for safety, but another round tore his right calf apart before he could submerge. Brilliant, he thought, as a scream of pain took over his lips. Bad ideas yield bad results. He was now 185 pounds of bloody shark bait.